Hello, this is Sam Gerrans from samgerrans.com. Today is Thursday, November the 9th, and today really is Thursday, uh, unlike uh, yesterday, uh, 2023. And today the subject is Frit Joff Schoen, uh, the evil of humanism. Now, I don't know if this is going to be a very long video. I know I famously make rather long videos, but I'll try to keep this short as possible. I'm reading this book, To Have a Centre, by Frit Joff Schoen. Apparently, this is how you pronounce it. Frit Joff Schoen. Um, I looked it up, and apparently that is how you pronounce it. Um, he was a Swiss-German uh, spiritual thinker, uh, I suppose affiliated, related to people like René Guénon, of whom I've mentioned quite a lot uh, on this channel. And I thought, I came to this... Uh, I mean, to do with reading at the moment, I'm, I'm reading less. I, I pretty much only read the Quran, and uh, and I that's the main thing that I read. And I choose other things that I read carefully. And um, I've realised that you not only have to read, um, you know, with a certain amount of discernment, um, and you have to read the right things and, and in the right order. So I, I I read less and I read more reflectively. And sometimes I just read things two or three times to make sure I really get it. Uh, and then I'd rather just think about it and not read for a while. So it's not, you know, just a matter of reading tons or the idea that the more you read, you know, the quote-unquote clever you are or whatever you're supposed to be, I don't know. But anyway, I came across this, there's two paragraphs, and I'm just going to read them to you, maybe, maybe make a few comments. Because I read this and I thought, this is absolutely spot on and it summarizes so many of the things that I touch on and especially so much of what I talk about is in the current part of my project is really trying to educate people in, in propaganda and it all gets rather depressing and for me anyway boring. Um, I thought I would share this instead as we'll have a bit of a day off from all of that. Now in this uh, essay to have a center what he's, he's talking about is conceptions of I suppose genius, um, but but more in the traditional sense, uh, as uh, but also in what we might call the, the modern humanistic profane sense, and also to do with caste. But anyway, I'm not going to burn you with all of that. Although, and I haven't read the whole book, so I can't speak to the whole book. But this is a you know a, sec a selection of of letters. Anyway, I'll just jump straight into it. What we wish to suggest in most of our considerations on modern genius, and just to say what he's talking about is that, um, well, he has quite a lot to say about it, but much of what we take to be genius um, is, uh, he doesn't deny talent, um, but, but a lot of it, uh, it has no, uh, to summarise, no actual traditional genre, and so therefore it's really just a load of blather. To continue, is is that humanistic culture, which is what we live in? Uh, just to give you a bit of backstory, um, he, I think he was born in 1900, or just uh, around there, and died, I think, 1998. Uh, no, 1907 to 1998. Just put, put him in some sort of context. And this book, I think, was written in the mid-1980s. What we wish to suggest in most of our considerations on modern genius is that humanistic culture, which is what we live in, and which is, I suppose, uh, if you want to, to, to consider there is a culture at all, is that culture which um, runs parallel or is intrinsic to what I talk about so much, which is the, 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 the technique, the society of technique, as summarised and explained by Jacques Ellul, and for which propaganda is almost like the, the natural corollary and required. Insofar as it functions as an ideology and therefore as a religion, and this is a point I've made over and over again, that it is a religion, consists essentially in ignoring three things. And here they are. Firstly, what God is, because it does not accord primacy to him. I, I would say it goes so far as to elide him completely. But certainly no primacy, you may be certain of that, even where there is some uh, sort of lip service paid, whether it's a state religion or whatever it is, there's no primacy. Because if it were primacy, it would be a theocracy. Secondly, what man is, because it puts him in the place of God. And that's precisely what it does. Uh, my theory is, is that the, uh, the Jews have the first true humanism because 
the actual god of the Jews is the are the Jews themselves. That's what they worship. I mean, if you were to you know, if you were an anthropologist and going to study, you know, sort of objectively without emotions or pre existing propaganda, that's the only conclusion you could really come to. Uh, but that's become uh, de rigueur for everybody. That's it's just that uh, they did it first. Thirdly, what the meaning of life is, because this culture limits itself to playing with evanescent things, things which are just fleeting, just here for a moment, and to plunging into them with criminal unconsciousness. In a word, there is nothing more inhuman than humanism, by the fact that it, so to speak, decapitates man. In wishing to make him an animal which is perfect, it succeeds in turning him into a perfect animal. Not all at once, because it has the fragmentary merit of abolishing certain barbaric traits. But in the long run, since it inevitably ends by re-barbarizing society, while dehumanizing it, ipso facto, in depth. Now, this is a long sentence. What he's saying is, is he's, he, there is a sort of a, maybe uh, an initial or partial improvement, but in the long term, what it does is dehumanize the society. To continue, a fragmentary merit, we say, because the softening of customs is good only on condition that it not corrupt man, that it not unleash criminality, nor open the door to all possible perversions. Now, if you look around you, and let's just, you know, we don't have to go very far, just look at, um, through the process of softening man in the so-called democratic countries and the countries which uh, subscribe to this humanism, which now is pretty much everywhere. They're all on the same conveyor belt, just on different parts of it. What we see in the most advanced cases is that they are um, perverts. What other word could you call it? They're deviants and, um, well, in a normal society you would have considered them an abomination. I'm not saying this to get a rise out of people or, you know, it's just a fact. Uh, I mean, what they do in Western societies now to their children would have, be, would have, I think, made a man of the medieval times vomit in the street. It's just, you know, it's just objectively the case. And all other societies are going towards this because if you uh, are part of technique, that's where you're going. You have no choice. To continue, in the 19th century, it was still possible to believe in an indefinite moral progress. And they did believe in that. I mean, for example, there was the celebration at the Crystal Palace and the various other sort of world fairs, world exhibitions. And the, you know, what was in the air at that time was that man had, uh, that science was, 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 well, it was certainly the god of that time, but to some extent, they thought that there was pretty much, they already discovered everything that could be discovered. And this was going to, this was the road to perfection. And you could kind of see it in, in those days. In the 20th century came the brutal awakening. People were forced to recognize that one cannot improve man by finding contentment on the surface while destroying the foundations. I mean, to try to put this in, a different um, different context. If you're from a Christian background or Christian society such such, such as I am, um, if you think back to how bored you are um, over the Christmas New Year period, this is what progress looks like. It's just more and more and more and you become a finally, you're just so sated and glutted and bored by it all that, uh, you know, you just can't stand any more of it. Man Real men are, by their nature, um, designed to seek God, uh, to transcend, to see something that isn't just horizontal, just wandering around. But we are meant to, you know, our our impetus is in that direction. And if we are decapitated, and that's the word he uses, and that's all cut off from us, then 
it's just an endless wandering around in a state of depression, which is what the propaganda that I talk about so much these days is designed to, um, to uh, well, I, I suppose, um, to increase, but also to um, serve as a palliative, as a way of putting up with this, because it's so painful, it really is. Okay, just a few more lines, second paragraph. Thus, there is no doubt that talent or genius does not constitute a value in itself. One thing is absolutely certain, so much so that one hesitates to mention it, and that is that the best way to have genius is to have it through wisdom and virtue, hence through holiness. Now, I'll just stop there. If you think of all these so-called geniuses, and he doesn't deny that some of them have talent, uh, you know, making, I'm not going to name any names, but if you just think of all the degenerate so-called culture that, you, you know, you're probably immersed in. Um, the argument often has been, you know, when I've raised this, oh, well, they're very talented. And okay, yes, they are. But it is simply um, a wandering around. Uh, it, there is nothing transcendent in it. And the point that he's making is that the best way to have genius, let's say that somebody has it, if you think of the very talented people that one, you know, who admittedly they are talented, um, but they're not transcendent at all. They're just better at wandering around in this empty valley. Um, what he says is that the best way to have genius, to express genius, to manifest it, if, if one has it, or has it in certain areas, is to have it through wisdom and virtue, hence through holiness. And this is really why I decided to put this out there. Because this is when I say that the best that you can hope for is to uh, be a healthy cell in a cancerous body, given what's going on. Then what he's really doing here is summarising much better than I could have done um, the pathway to that. Creative genius can certainly be added to this plenitude as a, as a supplementary gift for others even more than the one who possesses it, with the mission of transmitting elements of interiorization and thereby of liberation. I'm not going to get into this. He, like Guénon, speaks in this rather, in places, tortuous and somewhat geeky language. Um, I think sometimes it is a, a means of expressing subtleties that require that level of exactitude, and I think sometimes it's a cover for... Um, the fact that he's actually got lost himself. I mean, he's just a man like anybody. Clearly, pure spirituality suffices unto itself. Now, this idea of sufficing unto oneself, uh, this is anathema to the culture of humanism, which is all about numbers and having the maximum amount of attention from the maximum number of people. But the medieval man didn't think this way. You know, to the monk in his cell, witness of, of, of God and the angels was sufficient unto itself. This is really what he's talking about. So, um, clearly, pure spirituality suffices unto itself. I mean, clearly for him, but not for m most of us of today. But no one will reproach Dante for having known how to write, nor Fra Angelico for having known how to paint. So, you know, having your talents and using them, there is no uh, nothing bad about that. But the point that he's making is that, um, I suppose righteousness is its own reward. This is a deep and uh, important point. And I thought, given the, uh, the rest of what I've been explaining, kind of illustrating over the last few months, that I would make this point. Um, anyway... The book again, I haven't read it all, so I can't speak to it all. So please, you know, don't you know, write to me and say, ah, oh, I read this chap and he says this thing and you're, you know, blah, blah, blah. I haven't read it all. Okay, I haven't. But I have read this bit and it's called To Have a Centre uh, by, uh, there you are, you can see it. Flit Joff Schuon, apparently is how it's pronounced. I'm sure I'll be corrected, but that's what I got when I looked him up. And, uh, I thought that those two paragraphs were, were worth considering. I hope that's been of interest. Thanks for listening. And now I'll just say what I always say at the end of my stuff, which is details of where I upload to. Yes, how you can join my Substack and Telegram channel, support my work, 
and download my books free are in the description. Again, thanks for listening and bye for now.